All right, everybody. If we can uh, make our way to where we want to be, good afternoon. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Um, I'm Yuval Levin of AI, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion of Tim Carney's wonderful and important new book, Family Unfriendly, How Our Culture Made Raising Kids Much Harder Than It Needs to Be. Tim is a senior fellow here at AI uh, and a columnist at the Washington Examiner. His work, as a lot of us know, uh, focuses on family and community, on civil society, on religion, on American politics. Uh, he's been published widely beyond his columns, too, in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and elsewhere. You see him on TV a lot. Tim's work is unique. Um, he describes broad social trends by beginning from the experience of real people. He thinks from the bottom up, not from the top down. And for that reason, I think he has an understanding of how people thrive and how people fail, uh, what holds us together, what divides us, that is just deeply humane and sympathetic, even as it's always rooted in some moral fundamentals. His goal really is to prove that your grandmother was right. Um, <laughs> if you want to be happy, you should get married, you should have kids, you should go to church, you should show up for your neighbors, you should treat people well. But he also wants to explore what it is about modern life that makes it so hard to do what your grandmother told you to do um, and to see the value of these things. It's very much what this wonderful book is about. It looks at the various confused and complicated ways that our society has made life harder for parents, sometimes on purpose, but very often not on purpose, and it offers some ways forward. Tonight's conversation is going to take up all of that. Um, this event for us at AI is part of a series. We call it the Edward and Helen Heinz Book Forums. Uh, these are public events that are really intended to facilitate some conversation about important books on issues that touch on crucial public questions, books by AI scholars, but also by others. We're very grateful to the Heinzes for their support of these events and of AI. Our format's going to be very simple. Um, after I step down, we're going to watch a quick video about Tim's book. And then Tim is going to step up and talk about the book for a while. And after that, he'll be in conversation about it with Alyssa Rosenberg, the wonderful Washington Post columnist who writes about family and culture and a lot of the kinds of questions that uh, Tim takes up in his book. She's also, just as of the last few days, the um, community and letters editor. Is that right? Letters and community editor at the Washington Post. So she gets to hear from all kinds of very interesting people. Um, and she's really, I, I would say, her stuff gets forwarded to me more than just about anything else in the Washington Post, mostly from my wife. Um, and it is always profound and interesting. She takes up these same subjects, but from often a different angle than the one that Tim might take. And their conversation, in a certain way, could be a left-right conversation. But I think it's also going to show us that these kinds of issues are not really, in any simple way, left-right issues. Uh, the two of them will talk for a while, and then they can draw all of you into conversation, too, the people in this room. If you're watching us online, then right next to where you're watching us, you can see how to participate in that conversation, too, where to send an email or tweet, if you must, um, and how to uh, take part in, uh, in the discussion. And so with that, we'll watch a little something about the book, and then uh, we'll hear from Tim and go from there. Americans are having fewer and fewer kids every year. Politicians and commentators assume it's just about cost, but they don't tell the whole story. We need to take seriously the feeling that parenting has gotten harder. These days, parents need to be countercultural if they want to avoid maximum effort parenting. The feeling that it's not okay anymore to let your kids run around is mostly about misguided cultural expectations and norms. But also, our world is just more hostile to letting kids wander. For the sanity of today's children and parents, we need to regain that mindset, rebuild neighborhoods, and reshape our culture in a way that makes it easier for parents to let their kids go free. Tonight, this, this book has truly been a labor of love. I want, and in that regard, I want to specifically thank my wife, Katie, for, for coming. I was able to write with some knowledge about having six kids because of her. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, Katie. I remember with crystal clarity so many of the moments of my first day as a father. I remember the, when uh, we first met the baby, and that was sort of a, a shocking moment. But I also remember the, that night, we moved to the labor and delivery ro room, all of the emotions. What I, I think of as the, the burden of love that was, was falling on me. I also remember in the middle of the night when I couldn't sleep and Katie was asleep, the baby had been wheeled into this sort of makeshift nursery out in the hallway. And th there we go, that's the first day. Ma makeshift nursery out in the hallway. And I walk out there, I'm just staring at this perfect little face. And I'm thinking, what, what, what are you going to look like as a toddler? Are you gonna be a big sister of how many siblings? What's your future going to hold? And that's when the nurse tapped me on the shoulder and said, uh, sir, your, your daughter is three bassinets over. <laughs> you are currently staring at somebody else's child. <laughs> but the reason that the, the uh, nursery was in the hallway is because there, we were in an overflow wing of Sibley Hospital. Because 2006 saw a massive uptick in the birth rate. Everybody was having babies, everybody. Any famous person you can think of. So uh, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, they had a baby. Uh, and Suri Cruz was born there. Heidi Klum, uh, Britney Spears, they both had babies right around the same time we did. And then it went up even higher. In 2007, you had everybody following Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, <laughs> and me. And, <laughs> and people started having, and we had the highest number of births of any year in US history there was a belief that this could become a real baby boom because the millennials were just hitting their prime childbearing years. So rising birth rates, the millennials, a larger generation, turning uh, into their mid to late 20s, is it going to be a baby boom? Obviously it wasn't. It was a baby bust. Almost every year for the past 15 years, the number of babies born in the United States has fallen. And one of the results from 4.3 million babies down to 3.6 million. And this year, uh, last year, 2023, might end up being lower even than 2020, the pandemic year. <clears throat> Here's an important measure of it, the total fertility rate. This is a number most people are familiar with. 2.1 babies per woman is the replacement level at which a population will remain steady without immigration. We ticked above that, again, thanks to Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, and me, we ticked above that in 2007, but have been falling almost every year since then. Sorry about that y-axis, not down towards zero, but down towards 1.6, 1.7. So one result of this is we now actually have fewer children in America than we did at the last census. Not as a percentage of the population, but the raw number is lower in this census. This is uh, what's normally called the age pyramid. It's an age onion. I think now you can see the, the, one of the skinniest bars is down there at the bottom. Both two of the skinnier bars are down there at the bottom. So we have a legitimate real baby bust. In our lifetime, the US population is estimated to, beginning, to begin shrinking. Well, I should say in the lifetime of some people in this room. But yes, it, and so it's a real baby bust. I think it's the most important story of the next 30 years. And Americans are just starting to realize it. Now, a natural question is, why should we care? Why is this bad? Some people are creeped out. They think it's like a handmaid's tale or a thing that I care about other people not having enough babies. So this is a, uh, a friendly feminist liberal interlocutor on Twitter, Laura Bassett, and she just said, honest question, considering overpopulation is literally killing the planet, why does it matter to you? Why, why do you insist on more births? Another uh, liberal journalist I, I regard highly, Lydia DePillis, she looked at the data by a study, a study from Brookings University of Maryland scholar Melissa Carney uh, showing that the economic explanations don't really explain the falling, falling birth rate. And she said, surprise, younger women might just want more out of life than just children. So yes, why do we care? I divide it into four reasons. One, economic reason. The dependence ratio, how many retirees there are compared to workers as that grows, that reduces economic well-being. Two, women actually do still want babies. Three, the baby bus reflects something unwell about our culture. Even if you don't care about there being fewer babies, what's causing it is something you should care about. It has other root causes and other 
excuse me, other effects that are not great. And four, you should mind there being fewer babies because babies are actually good. So let's start with that first reason, the economic. The dependency ratio. We now have more Americans in their 60s than we have children under age 10. So along with that, the working age population, which used to steadily climb, has now flatlined. So we're not getting more potential workers. What does this mean? One easy example is my favorite restaurants used to be open for lunch. As a, as a writer, sometimes you get the benefit of getting to work from an Irish pub, right? And now, now the fact that I now have to wait till 4 p.m. to start working from an Irish pub is not in itself a problem, <laughs> a reason to worry about this. But you do have other things like that. What about the fact that the wait time for 911 calls in Montgomery County, Maryland, or in D.C. is getting longer because they're having trouble stacking, uh, filling all the jobs for dispatchers? That's a real problem. Economist Alan Cole put it this way, no, neither private savings nor government pension schemes work unless there are enough workers to meet the needs of older Americans. Now it's possible that artificial intelligence is going to solve all of these problems, uh, but it will at least take a while. And I think that Gemini fixing your leaky pipes might be a little subpar. So that's the, the economic story. <clears throat> More important reason, women actually still want kids. This is, uh, Gallup always asks, what is the ideal number of kids in a family? The number's actually been going up in recent years to 2.7. There's no difference, by the way, between how women answer this poll and how men answer this poll. And millennials are still way above two. There's a great economist, uh, uh, demographer named Lyman Stone, who came up with a, this graph. This is sort of the lowball estimate of what the ideal family is, using different surveys, 2.3 kids. But then another question, how many children do you intend to have? The answer among, uh, among millennials was 1.9. So right there you have a little bit of gap between the ideal and the intended. And then the actual number of babies is a little below 1.7. So we are setting our goals lower than our ideals and we're not even meeting those lower goals. And so to get into the nuances for a second, that's what the baby bus reflects. You see two different gaps there. One is a reduced desire for family or a desire for a smaller family. And then the other is a failure to meet what people want. And so if we want more kids, why aren't we having them? So I'm gonna take a break from those four reasons for now and consider this. Or the broader question, why is the birth rate falling? So quick story from my book. I got to travel all over the world. I got to go to Israel. I got to go to places where the birth rate was collapsing. I got to go to where it was fine. Utah has a pretty high birth rate. And so I went, I walked around Salt Lake City in a neighborhood that looked like one of the best neighborhoods to raise kids called the Avenues. You had trees on the streets. You had nice single family houses that were, you know, everyone had a little yard. And one of the things I noticed was I didn't run into any families at all. So finally I run into this couple. Their name is Isaac and Nicole. And they're walking down the sidewalk and I ask Isaac and Nicole, I say, hey, I'm writing a book, can you talk to me? I'm writing about family. And Nicole instantly blurts out, we don't want kids. <laughs> and so I say, you sure? She said, yes. I said, why not? She said, we can't afford it. I said, what exactly is like the, the main affordability, the main affordability problem you're facing? And Isaac says, everything, healthcare, but if I'm being honest, really I'm just selfish. Then he says, I always say to Nicole, other people are watching Teletubbies and cleaning up vomit, and we're going to be drinking margaritas in Paris. And then at that moment, a woman came down with a stroller, greeted Isaac and Nicole, is a double stroller. Both of the passengers in the double stroller were chihuahuas. So I walked away from this scene with my mind reeling for all sorts of reasons. One was this was like a scene out of P.D. James's Children of Men. <laughs> Two, why would you go to Paris to drink margaritas? <laughs> but three, those reasons, affordability and selfish that he gave are the standard reasons. I don't think they hold up. So for one thing, the baby bus has gotten worse as the economy has often gotten better. That's the birth rate. That gray bar was a great recession. People had a lot more babies during the recession than they did in 2019 when we had the best economy in years. And again, that study from Melissa Carney that Lydia DePillis cited saying little evidence to support the usual economic explanations, 
places where rent went up did not see where rent went up more did not see a greater decrease in birth rate. Places where student loan debt went up did not see a greater decrease. Same with rising child care costs. They didn't predict greater decreases in the birth rate. Millennials think that they are poorer, and for the most part, they're not really. So lots of economists, this is from Jeremy Horpital, have looked at the actual wealth of across the generations and found that millennials and Gen Z are about as wealthy as Gen X and probably a little more wealthy than the baby boomers yet they have a lot fewer babies. So this was Jeremy Horpadal did a study of how many weeks of work does it take the median American male to earn as much as it, the estimated cost of raising a child. So the estimated cost of raising a child goes up. The, estimated, the median income goes up. Guess what, the median income is going up higher than the estimated cost of raising a child since 2010 while the birth rate has been falling. That right bar, the 12.2 the weeks that means it takes less time to pay for, the, for a, a male to pay for the raising a kid than it did in 2010. So the other, estimate, other explanation is that selfishness causes the, the baby bus. Surely it's there, but you can't blame selfishness for falling birth rates any more than Boeing could blame gravity for falling airplanes. Selfishness is always there. If I had made a chart for this one, it would start at zero, and then Adam and Eve eat the apple, it goes up to 100, and then it's flat after that. <laughs> but what does change over time and across places is the, the ability of society, of civilization, to offset that selfishness. That's what the job of society and civilization and culture is, is to steer people's self-interest towards the common good. So that, to me, suggests what we have is a failure of culture that gap between the uh, attained family and the desired family and the gap between the desired family and the ideal family, those are failures of our society. And they're not just failures to give people, you know, massive houses with wraparound porches. We're falling short, our culture is falling short on helping people achieve something incredibly important, which is family. It's a deficit of flesh and blood. And that's something that we really should care about. So again, Another piece of evidence that culture is a problem, those, are, those bars are the countries in the OECD, what their birth rate is. The average is just above 1.5. There's one outlier there, it's Israel. Israel is not richer or poorer than the average country, it's about in the middle in the OECD. Its education level is a little above average. Its welfare state is about in the middle of all of those countries, yet its birth rate is about twice the average. Israel differs from the other countries mostly in its culture. We can get more into that. But this, again, points to the problem. Something is unwell in our culture. Our culture is not delivering what it should, which is the support of families. Parents don't just, the, abil the decision, the ability to have children isn't just an individual decision between two people. It's something that requires surrounding institutions, neighbors, to do. A wise woman put it well once when she said it takes a village to raise a child. <laughs> if our village is failing, that's problematic even if you don't care about the lack of the children. So how is our culture broken? One, parenting culture is broken. My video pointed towards that, so I'll, I'll race through that. But parents spend a lot more time now, mothers spend a lot more time now than our grandmothers did or mothers did back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Even though dads have doubled their dadding time, which is very good, women have increased ability to work outside the home, which is very good. So you would think that mom would get a break compared to her mom or her grandma, but no. This is a, a time use survey that's ours solely parenting. So not counting cooking, not counting any family activities, it's driving kids to an event. It's, it's watching them, uh, making sure they do their homework. So that's parenting culture gone haywire. Some people think that's good. I keep quoting um, uh, Melissa Carney at, at Brookings. She said, smaller families among higher income people could reflect a quantity quality trade-off. I hate that phrase, not just because it implies that my wife and I chose the quantity half of that, because <laughs> we have six children, but, um, but because I think it's false. But is Isabel Sawhill, an excellent scholar at Brookings, she puts it this way, with fewer children to support, parents and society can both invest more in each child. And that's supposed to help the children. I don't think it does. 
I think that the rise in childhood anxiety, that is the sister problem of the falling birth rates. The Journal of Pediatrics, a lot of you saw this, they said that a primary cause of the rise in mental disorders in young children is the loss of freedom to play without being supervised by parents. That loss of freedom, the high quality, high intensive parenting has bad outcomes, not just for parents, but for kids. One instance of that is how youth sports gets replaced by travel sports. The idea that, that sport baseball is good in and of itself, that sports is for building virtues, gets replaced by a relentless desire for achievement, excellence, beating the next guy. The demand for helicopters. Here uh, I quote Katie, I'm a little more free range than she is, and when I do something that she thinks presses uh, the boundaries, she repeatedly would say, I'm not afraid of kidnappers taking our kids, I'm afraid of CPS, Child Protective Services. Um, we lived in Silver Spring where there were famous free-range parents who repeatedly got in trouble for letting their kids walk to the park. And uh, in our, one, of our, near our, one of our old neighborhoods, there was an attempt to put in a sidewalk near an elementary school. And one of the women who objected to the sidewalk said, well, little kids like this shouldn't be walking to school by themselves anyway. Our culture is, is family-unfriendly in specifically this way, that they don't want kids to be free. So this is one of the chapter titles of my book. If you want fecundity in the sheets, you need walkability in the streets. We don't have walkable communities. A lot fewer kids walk to school than they used to. More importantly, a lot fewer kids just run around and are told, ride your bike wherever you want, just come home when the street lights turn on. This leads to stressed parents, anxious kids, and I think fewer kids. Our culture is also broken because our culture of dating is totally dysfunctional. And it's dysfunctional, I'm going to dwell on this a little bit because it's, di it's dysfunctional in a way that I think is telling. So dating apps, uh, Kate Julian, who's a, a writer, she told a story about one effect dating apps happen have that this one guy who's on this co-ed volleyball team, he wanted to ask out this girl and he decided it would be boorish or incredibly awkward to ask the girl out in person because they played volleyball together and somehow that was abusing the, the rights of the volleyball team. When, when I talk about this to college kids, I say, or young adults, I say, if you're on a co-ed volleyball team, the point of that is to meet people of the opposite sex, okay? You're not, it's not to play volleyball. You're, <laughs> but again, there's a deeper problem here. And it involves the fact that the, the dating apps give this double secret consent, and that's how it's supposed to be okay. Because even asking somebody out could be an affront. And the, and the deeper root, um, here's a quick excerpt from the book. I don't do relationships, explains Jesse, my bartender in Greenville, South Carolina. Jesse brags that he has risen above his, quote, ultra-conservative Southern Baptist upbringing with its traditionalist sexual mores. I'm a feminist, he explains. These are all connected for Jesse. In his romantic life, which mostly flows from the apps Tinder and Bumble, or from his clientele at the college bar, he, he explains, I'm honest, I don't really do dating. There are a lot of women who are into that because they've been in possessive relationships. Possessive, after all, is the opposite of liberating. The sexual revolution was fought, as millennial author Christine Emba puts it, on the belief that, quote, to achieve ideal, the ideal sexual world that we desire, we just need to realize freedom more completely. By freedom, we mean more privacy, more space, less connection, and less constraint. Today's sexual culture, writes feminist author and activist Louise Perry, prefers to understand people as freewheeling, atomized individuals, all looking out for number one and up for a good time. You can see why this liberated, unconstrained, modern approach to sex, dating, and marriage, known as a hookup culture since the 1990s, would be fun for guys like Jesse. So how's it working out for everybody else? I don't think it's working out well. I think there's a real sadness that you see in all these stories. The delay in marriage, the aversion to dating, the fear of putting yourself at risk that's involved necessarily in asking somebody out or going on a date, but it's also an aversion to connection and commitment. And this again points to our cultural values. Autonomy and consent are the dominant values, almost the only values of our day. And in such a culture, kids don't fit because you can't just grant kids autonomy and kids are not really capable 
of consenting to much, but also they're just, kids become just one more lifestyle choice or a consumption item. Stephanie Murray has a great quote, and it shows up in Family Unfriendly multiple times. Children are a personal choice, and therefore a personal problem, many people seem to believe. Have as many as you want, just make sure they don't bother the rest of us. Uh, Republican Senator Ron Johnson put it in, uh, in his own words when opposing a tax credit for families. Parents decide to have families, people decide to have families and become parents. The cost is something they need to consider when they make that choice. I've never really felt it was society's responsibility to take care of other people's children. I think there's a good debate to have about tax credits for families, and hopefully we'll talk about it later, but that it's not society's job to help people raise their children. This is this sad mindset that I think is really behind the problem. Again, the Christine Emba line. By freedom, we mean more privacy, more space, less connection, and less constraint. And if this sounds sad, it's because it is sad. And I think that sadness is the root. So this is Miley Cyrus, and I'll, I'll try to race through the Miley Cyrus section of this talk. To, I, I wanted to sort of build the book around Miley Cyrus, but uh, my editor is advised against that. But she said the Earth can't handle we, that we're getting handed a piece of crap planet, and she refuses to hand that down to her child. And that's why she, speaking for all millennials, is not going to have a child. This is something you hear all the time, overpopulation. Where did they hear it from? This is a newspaper article from when I was a kid. New York Times, no problem facing the Earth looms larger than the growth of the reproductive rate of the human species. Virtually all human suffering can be attributed to the crushing effect of a population that's too numerous. Now, I always like the illustration on this because we are all breeding like rabbits, if you get it. Those are bunny rabbits, and they are devouring the Earth, which is a large head of cabbage. The point of this op-ed was not just that babies are bad, but that we need to tell children that babies are bad, school children. And the writer was a principal at an elementary school, a public elementary school, the John Pettibone School in New Milford, Connecticut. As a side note, the John Pettibone School closed down in 2014 due to low and falling enrollment. <laughs> <laughs> but that overpopulation idea is, is running rampant. Uh, pessimism about the future is increasing. That's in just eight years, a uh, massive increase. So Ezra Klein at the New York Times has a good explanation of it. He says that that fear that our planet's on fire is really just a cover story for guilt, especially in the, in the rich Western world. I go a step further. I think the climate guilt that he's talking about is really a totem for a deeper guilt, for a deeper sadness. Again, the Earth can't handle it, Miley Cyrus says. She means the Earth can't handle us. The Earth can't handle humans. It's a, it's a deeply sad idea. And civilizational sadness, I believe, is causing the baby bust. I met a woman named Amanda. She was on my trivia team one night. And she, when I said, I have six kids, she says, oh, that sounds horrible. And so I asked her. She had a good job. She was married. She said she doesn't want to have kids. And as we were going, eventually I asked her her opinion of the human race. And she said, in general, do I think people are good? No. I think we're the cancer of the earth. I think that's telling. I think that that mindset, not necessarily always explicitly expressed, is behind the civilizational sadness that's causing the anxiety and the lack of babies. The Pope Francis has said the opposite. I mean, the same premise, but he said, birth rates and a welcoming attitude reveal how much happiness is present in a society. So I think what we're seeing now is how little happiness is present in our society. And I think the baby boom, it was not a makeup for the babies that weren't born during the war. This was an unprecedented, generation-long, totally unpredicted, increase in the number of babies. Why? Think about it. Our men got off the boat and landed on the dock, just having defeated Hitler and the Japanese Empire. And the women were waiting there, just having kept the economy going for four years. So they meet on the pier, they smooch, they go back, get married in the chapel, and they have a bunch of kids. Because they knew we were good. Because never before or since has it been so clear to Americans, we're good. We need more of us. The flip side of, thank you. <laughs> the flip side of that is what happened in the Axis uh, countries. I, it was about 10 years ago that I noticed that Japan, Germany, and Italy were three of the lowest uh, birth rates in the country. They couldn't say, we are good. So my final argument, though, is that, in fact, we are good. 
and babies are good. But so to start just with humans in general, that green part there, that is the number of uh, humans who are living above the poverty level. So you, and the red is below. So you see at first the percentage of humans living below the poverty level begins to fall, and then the number begins to fall. So who is pulling humans out of poverty? Maybe it's uh, climate change. Maybe it's space aliens. Maybe it's Google Gemini pulling us out of poverty, but more likely it's humans. That is, some humans do bad, but most the good that's done by humans outweighs that bad. My, a lot of my friends here are economists, so I put an economic term. The, ec the expected value of each human is positive. So I just want to end here with a couple more ways to try to argue that humans are good. One study I looked at found that people give more money to charity when children are around, like throwing money in the bucket. A more important one is this. The first two-thirds of family unfriendly are arguing how to be more family friendly so parenting can be easier. But anyone who's done it knows that raising children is the hardest thing you're ever going to do. But it's the easiest path if your goal, where you're trying to get, is anywhere valuable. If you want to be a man or a woman of virtue, I think that parenting is the easiest road. It's not the only road, obviously. As a Catholic, many great saints obviously never had kids. But for those of us who are not at the level of the average, uh, the average well-known saint in the Catholic Church, we might need some help. For instance, the Bible says, feed the hungry, clothe the naked. I wake up in the morning, there are hungry, naked people right there in my house. <laughs> They're waiting for me. So just to end with a, one excerpt from the end of the book. It's about Mrs. Anastasi. She was a preschool teacher who taught five of our kids. She actually helped bring us into the parish where we spent so many years. She uh, sent out an email and we found out too late she was not gonna be there for the final day. So for her final day, the second to last day of school, that's where my excerpt begins. We owed Mrs. Anastasi the greatest of all last day of school teacher presents, but with her early start to summer vacation, we didn't have time to get anything. And so on the next morning, her last day teaching a carny kid, I brought her the only thing I could, my kids. Mrs. Anastasi opened the door at 7.35 to the gift of Eve, Sean, Meg, Brendan, and Charlie, all beaming. She cried and hugged my crew, her crew, all of whom she had taught. It's common to mock parents for believing their child is God's gift to the world, but very literally, children Sorry. Very literally, children are God's gift to us. My children are gifts to others not because my children are special, but because my children are children. Humans are good. That truth is obscured at times by our own self-absorption or others' imperfections, but children, in their innocence, reflect mankind's innate goodness back to us. In one of Charles Dickens', Charles Dickens stories about human wretchedness, the protagonist is a kind and generous child named Nell. The narrator, an old man who wanders London alone, runs into Nell when she's lost and in need of help. This guileless cherub gives him her trust and friendship and so instantly cheers and inspires the old man in a way almost any reader would instantly understand. I love these little people, the narrator says, and it is not a slight thing when they who are so fresh from God love us. As I had felt pleased at first by her confidence, I determined to deserve it. I still get that feeling even after 17 years, and even when again and again, I failed to deserve it. So it's easy to believe these days that we're not good. But the love of a little one reminds us that we are good, that you are good. Could you be better? Could I be better? Yes. But nothing will inspire you to be better more than taking on your back that burden of love. Thank you very much. I don't know how many of you in this room have been lucky enough to get an early glimpse at Tim's book, which I think I was one of the first people to read and which I just adored. Um, I only have two kids, two or six, but it was, and I know I'm supposed to be asking you questions, not just praising you, but it is a book that if you are a parent will make you want to be a better parent. And if you think about family policy, 
will make you want to do more for families. It's a beautiful and important book, and I hope everyone here goes out and buys it as soon as possible, because I don't want you to have that pleasure delayed. It's just terrific. Um, to start off, I want to ask you a personal question, because this is a book about you know, what you learned in the process of parenting, but you write about politics. You live in the public world. How did parenting change your political views? I think the main way was in teaching me, uh, showing me how complicated everything was. So you imagine a sort of, I'd been a, a libertarian, like a lot of my friends, like a Randian in high school, and then I came out as a conservative, and I sort of thought, you know, a lot of things are, are very simple, and then you have kids, and anything that's simple becomes less simple. I think I quote Mike Tyson saying, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Uh, <laughs> Similarly, everyone can have a uh, simple ideology until they're dealing with, with children. So th that's the main way. I don't know if it made me, I don't want to say it made me more liberal. It made me more bleeding heart. Um, and, but it also try, it made me more understanding of, of people who were struggling. So, but mostly it made me realize that things are much more complicated than I would have thought. And it, it's interesting because I feel like I've had some of that same experience as well. I mean, you know, I have been a journalist for almost 20 years. I, you know, I grew up in second wave feminism. My mom actually worked for Bella Abzug and has hilarious stories about what she was like <laughs> as a boss. I think my mom volunteered for Bella Abzug. You know, <laughs> see, <laughs> Bella Abzug and parenting, the two great unifying experiences. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think parenting has a way of making politics unpredictable. And, you know, some of your presentations may be a little gloomy, um, but I think both of us see potential good news in the political sphere, if not, you know, in the larger culture. Um, I, you know, I think one of the things that we've seen as people have come to realize how family unfriendly the country is, um, something that was really illustrated for a lot of families by the shutdowns and upheavals of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think we've seen a lot more unity around the idea that our political system needs to be doing more for American families. Yes. Um, and I, I'm curious what you think, if anything, changed on the right to open up a conversation about expanding the child tax credit, about you know moving a conversation on paid leave forward. Because I think as a liberal, part of what I see is some movement on the right towards policies that have been priorities on the left for a long time. Um, and I'm curious what, if anything, you think changed to shake loose some of those conversations. I, I think there's a ton of things. But one moment that struck, that jumped out at me was when Rick Santorum was running for president um, in 2012, and uh, in response to the line, a rising tide lifts all boats, which is true. It's, it's very true that an improved economy can address lots of these things. He said, uh, not the boats that have holes in them. And that was this moment of realizing that, OK, we have an obligation to try to like, you know, stimulate the economy as much as possible. Free markets are great, et cetera. But also that, uh, that some people need extra accommodation. And so he was talking about people who were suffering long-term unemployment or disability. And in a way, parents kind of suffer disability. <laughs> I mean, if you've ever carried your kid on your chest while you're trying to like push a shopping cart around or open a door, it's the similar to how I felt after I had my shoulder surgery. And so the idea that we need to give everybody equal opportunity is sort of a, <clears throat> it's an old conservative idea, but then the idea that actually some people need to be accommodated, that, that's true. And the more that you face reality, the more that you see it. And I think that might be part of, part of the shift. I mean, we, I could talk about how Donald Trump uh, sort of shook conservatives out of some of their libertarianism, but I, I think the, the <laughs> philosophical approach is more interesting. I, I think we'd rather be unified by the experience of parenting than by Donald Trump. No yeah. offense to anyone in this room. <laughs> but, um, you know, do you see the left evolving on family policy in any ways that surprise you? So one interesting thing is, in, if you look at Canada, they're trying a, a sort of national child care program. And they are, the government there is very clear that the point of national child care is more women in the workforce, more mothers working 40 hours a week. I don't think that's a, a, a worthwhile goal to dedicate a massive amount of your, your GDP to. 
in the US, when I, I've talked to Biden administration people, and they've said, yeah, there's a debate here between whether our goal should be more women in the workforce or supporting families. That, I think, is a tack away from some um, you know, 1990s era feminism and more of an embrace of the idea that, okay, we should be supporting women wherever they are and not trying to push this idea of motherhood is a, a patriarchal thing. And so you hear those ideas all the time, sort of anti-marriage, anti-stay-at-home mom. That's more in the magazines. When I look at Democrats who are involved in governing in the US, especially compared to Canada and Europe, they seem to be more interested in, in helping women regardless of what path they're choosing. It's interesting because I think that um, some of this sort of cultural coming together around the idea that families ought to be able to make a range of different choices, that people will have a range of different preferences and that's fine, makes tailoring policy somewhat more complicated, right? Because it's one thing to say, we're gonna open a bunch of daycare centers. It's more politically complicated to say, you know, the easiest way to accommodate all of these different preferences on childcare would be to give everybody $10,000 a child that they could use either to pay for center-based care or a nanny or to, you know, as a salary for a stay-at-home parent. Take time off work, build a, a granny flat for your mom or whatever, yes. And so, the, and so one of the things I get into in Family Unfriendly is that debate over if you're going to spend money to help kids, how effective is it and how should you do it? And I really think that subsidizing childcare directly is a horrible way to do it because you, that money is just better spent giving it to parents. Child care subsidies are basically work subsidies. And there's lots of data, I think, from Northern Europe where they start subsidizing child care, they get a little uptick in the birth rate, and then it drops through the floor. And polls show them becoming more, uh, start valuing work more than family over those years. And so also the, the other conclusion I came to, so I, when I went into this, I wanted to have a big, bold conclusion where I was gonna either come out for like a massive child tax credit or no child tax credit, something that would go viral and instead I came up with, we should slightly increase the child tax credit. Because <laughs> if you do it too much, I think it has negative side effects of discouraging marriage for one thing. And if you, but if you don't have it where it is now a little bit bigger, then you're basically discriminating against families. Well, and I certainly think that one area of consensus, and this should be something that's easier to do, is just smash all marriage penalties in federal policy. Yes. Let's, let's the earned it. income tax credit has marriage penalties. Well, there's there's lots lots of those. Yeah, and I mean a lot of welfare programs for poorer uh, families as well. Um, but I mean it's interesting because I think that you know giving parents autonomy also requires accepting that parent that parents will make not just different choices but choices that some people find really objectionable or find incomprehensible. I mean DC did a recent pilot where gave pretty large no strings attached sums of money to um, you know to parents in DC and then the post came in and wrote about how they spent it and in some cases they spent it on really practical immediate things in some cases it was a chance to give a family a vacation that they would never have otherwise and you know I think that one area that would be sort of interesting to try to square the circle on for conservatives and liberals working together is, you know, how do we create some more tolerance of other people's choices? And sometimes that's gonna mean somebody wants to stay home. Sometimes that means that someone is gonna wanna blow it all on a trip to Disney World. And how do you, you know, foster that trust and to a certain extent that respect for other people's family choices, which, you know, around money at least, yeah. um, which I think has not always been forthcoming. No, I mean, people think if you're getting tax dollars, then I get to have a say, and yeah. I should make sure you're not spending the tax dollars to harm yourself. If you're spending the tax dollars on uh, gambling or, or drugs or just 30 packs of Bill or High Life, then people are going to say, I'm, I'm not sure that we should be giving you this money. And so the paternalism comes in when the money comes in, which is, again, another reason to not make it uh, too large. But I, I like to think that if you're too, that uh, from a conservative perspective, if your, your choices are give people some money and hope that they spend it well, or increase government and bureaucracy and get more involved in everybody's life, and if I'm given those two choices, I'm gonna choose give them some money, hope, them, hope they spend it well. 
I also want to ask about, I think, a risk of the framing that you've taken in this presentation, in this book. Um, you know, I think one clear driver of some more family-friendly policy on the right has been sort of the rise of pronatalism, the idea that we need more babies, we need to convince people to have more kids. What happens if we do all these things and the birth rate doesn't increase? Does the support for these policies disappear, or do we need to be making a case that we should do things that make life easier for parents because they're inherently good, and we should do things that support children because that's an inherently good thing to do? I think that's right, and even, I mean, so we're in a, a public policy think tank here, and so my first reaction was to say, well, if we can reduce childhood anxiety in a measurable way, then that's also good, and then you phrased it better. If, if you make kids and parents happier, that's good. <laughs> and so it's one of the tricky things about talking about, the, about culture in general is that we always want to have these measurable outcomes, but what actually matters in the end is not always measurable. That sometimes when you say, well, I'm explaining it by culture, you'll see economists roll their eyes because to them that means I don't really have an explanation of it. But so that's why I, I'm skeptical of a lot of the things that just involve spending money. I don't think you can raise the birth rate without changing the culture, specifically changing the culture to m make people who are parents or would be parents feel more supported. And that's not an easy thing to do, right? I, you can't snap your fingers and become Israel, obviously. That's an exceptional circumstance. And so that's why f for the book I went out to Utah. You can't snap your fingers and become a Mormon community. You can't snap your fingers and become the, the sort of communities my wife and I raise our kids in, sort of Catholic, big family, very Irish. You let your kids run around. You see somebody else's kids. They don't have shoes on. You're not surprised that that's not, um, you can't just do that. And you certainly can't directly do that through policy. And, um, but you can ask which policies can change and move and nudge the culture in the right direction. Uh, well, and I mean, I think culture also overlaps with sort of the idea of branding here, right? I mean, I think there's a certain reaction on the left to sort of pronatalist framing because I think people react perhaps rightly against the idea that we should all, you know, follow <laughs> Xi Jinping thought and march off and have a lot of babies for the glory of the United States. Uh, <laughs> and, but, you know, how do we rebrand parenting? This is something that you and I have talked about yeah. that I've thought about a lot. You know, we I- We should hire McKinsey to come up with a new name. For we should, we should, you know- But even parenting, so this was a point, and I forget the first author I read did it. Parenting wasn't really a verb yes. 50 years ago. Maybe you were the one who introduced me to this idea that it, it was kind of what you did. Yeah. And so that's part of the problem is that um, for a conservative, I see the idea that, uh, you know, now again, we give it a name, the success sequence. But you finish school, you get a job, you marry a girl, you have kids, and if you don't want to do that, that's still fine, but that's kind of the normal uh, course of events. I think there's a lot of value in that being the normal course of events. And the, the Stephanie Murray quote I used, that once it became an individual choice, it was, it was um, it, you know, part of intentional living. You intentionally chose, now is the right time for me to have a kid. Among all the other choices that could be open to me, this is the one I choose. Then it kind of became, A, more pressure that you do it right, and B, your own problem, as Murray's summary in the Ron Johnson quote put it. So that is, is part of it. So I don't know if I could rebrand it as much as just sort of establish, hey, anybody who doesn't feel they're called to have kids, don't have kids. I'm a Catholic. My, all my favorite priests don't have kids. But if, <laughs> but if you are, if, if we just have it as a norm that, yeah, most people, you, you try to get married. And then when you get married, you have kids. If it becomes more normal, I think it becomes less of a big deal. And then we can kind of rebrand it as sort of an easier, more fun thing to do. Parenting, in my experience, is trading out happy hours for backyard barbecues with a lot more friends running around. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's sort of critique my own side of the aisle. I think that there has been a real trend in feminist conversations, and you see this in publishing in particular recently, of you know reckoning with motherhood by talking about how horrible it is, and you know I read books like Minna Dubin's Mom Rage um, or you know Good Moms Bad Choices, and to be honest, don't recognize my own experience in them because 
you know, having children did limit my options, right? You, you know, I can't spend an entire month in LA and Utah going to the Television Critics Association press tour <laughs> and the Sundance Film Festival, which, by the way, the best reason to go to Sundance is really the High West Bourbon, it's not the movies. Um, I can't do that with kids, but the constraint, choosing the constraint was one of the most liberating things I ever did because all of a sudden I had a rubric where I knew what was important. I knew what the priority was. I, you know, I had a heart out at the end of the day. Um, the Washington Post letters to the editor inbox never rest, but <laughs> I do. And, you know, I, I wonder if that pendulum needs to be yanked back, if there needs to be more of a public conversation about the joys of parenting, the joys of having a kid. I mean, I, I sort of joke, like, do we need to bring back the family sitcom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so one of the problems is that um, social media, you know, replaced TV. And on social media, the only two kinds of mom content I've seen are the, the sort of perfect mom influencers who, uh, as I, what I noticed and I put in, in the book was that they always have an affect of ease. It always looks like, oh, we were just running around and we snapped this family photo. So they like, have the, the boy, the three-year-old boy be wearing his socks outdoors and somehow they're all, they all live in farmhouses, yes. which, which means that they have like exposed uh, joists and rafters and, and that, that just makes it look even that much more natural. A constant natural state and, of natural light. Of natural you know. light and, and so that is intimidating. It makes uh, the social comparison that either mothers or would-be mothers have is I can't pull that off. I'm not a, a ballerina who can make my own, you know, uh, cereal from scratch or whatever. Um, but the other half of social media is the parenting is just hell social media. And that, I think it's an effort to like, to give them the benefit of the doubt, an effort to sort of like make other parents feel seen. but. Social media works differently than you know a magazine or a TV show or a book. It just pounds the algorithm, just pounds more and more of it into your head. And it's not contextual, right? You don't see sort of the whole picture. It's not considered. You don't have time to sort of absorb and you know sort of consider or even reject the information before you're on to the next thing. Yeah. So if we could somehow get a lot of mom influencers who are like, "Hey, I had this one good moment today. Here it is." and this made all the rest of it worth it, or is gonna say, uh, I made this cake, this is what I wanted it to look like, this is what it looked like, guess what, all the kids ate it. Like, that would be the sort of mom influencers we need. Yeah, well, and also dad influencers too, right? I mean, I um, was sort of heartened by the rise of the Congressional Dads Caucus, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's mostly Democrats, but Jimmy Gomez, who founded it after spending most of Kevin McCarthy's Adventure Sunrise to Speaker wearing his son Hodge, you know, said, you know, he went and reached out to Dan Crenshaw when Crenshaw was having his first kid. It was like, this is great. It's hard, but it's fun. And I think more of those images of dadding, too. Yeah. Um, you know, we need the vast normie army to defeat Andrew Tate. Well, uh, we should field some questions. Yes. I'll just make one more, one, one more dad point. Um, it really, it's the, some of the best news I came across here was the increased uh, amount of time doing parenting that, that dads have done over the last few generations compared to the past. And one of the, I, there's, I was at this hearing on Capitol Hill the other day where one woman said, how can we involve men in a more equitable way in the, the caregiving? And I thought, by not talking about it that way, <laughs> equitable caregiving is not attractive. How can we like tell dads that they should be dads and that it's awesome to be dads? One of the things I was doing the other week was posting on Twitter me defeating all of my sons in basketball. And some of it is awesome, because one of my sons is, is arguably taller than I am, and <laughs> can certainly jump higher than I am. And then the other one is even more awesome because he's seven, and when he shoots, I just swat the heck out of the ball. <laughs> Being a dad is totally awesome, and if in a society that either says, um, you know, you should be Andrew Tate, or dads should just basically be moms, then ne that's not gonna be appealing to, to normal dudes. I don't think Katie likes to, you know, destroy her, well, she doesn't get as much pleasure out of destroying her children in sports as I do, so. 
Um, you anyway. get to play with Magnus Highlands again. <laughs> that's, uh, I feel like that's been one of the big discoveries for my husband. It's like you get to play with all of the construction toys. You get to do train sets again. It's awesome. Um, I could talk to Tim forever. Um, I could have lived in the world of this book forever, but I know I'm sure many of you have questions. So, Leah? I also had the pleasure of reading the book already. It's excellent. Um, one question I'd like to ask you is about a topic that hasn't come up so much, which is about family-friendly policies in the workplace. Yes. Because mm -hmm. you make a number of suggestions that employers should subsidize snoo rentals for, uh, <laughs> for parents. These are robotic bassinets that they're rock amazing. your baby they to sleep in a kind of creepy way. Um, <laughs> they're not creepy. They're amazing. They're a lifesaver. <laughs> I don't want computers watching my kids. Anyway. that. It was historically the case employers might pay a family wage where someone gets a raise for having a kid rather mm -hmm. than for merit. Um, and that employers might proactively steer parents towards a family-friendly schedule with more flex work, uh, looser responsibilities. And most of these, except for the snoo rental, are illegal, as far as I know. So I'm curious, do you think a family-friendly economy requires us to overhaul employment and anti-discrimination law? I, I certainly, I certainly worry about that, and I'm not a lawyer. I know there are some lawyers in the room, um, but so uh, giving a guy a raise because he has a kid, or giving a woman a raise because she has a kid, uh, theoretically could be illegal. On the other hand, the way the economy works, the the story I tell in the book is of imagine that you are a high school English teacher at a at a high school you love. And part of what you get compensated in is that you're getting paid to read books and talk about it. And um, that's not as valuable once you have kid number three. And you say, yes, honey, I know Stella could use a pair of sneakers. But can I tell you instead about the conversation we had about Hawthorne in the teacher's lounge today? You need to get paid more. So that school might actually pay that guy more. And would that be illegal as a breadwinner bump? I don't know. But I, I certainly think that the idea, uh, so guiding somebody who wants to be a stay-at-home parent towards a stay-at-home job. So if you have a reporter who's a beat reporter, tell him or her, hey, become an editor. We'll start working with you now. And by the time you leave and then come back from your maternity leave, you'll be editing the outside contributors. That, or, and then imagine schools. Imagine schools teaching people. And now this would be tricky because it would mostly be women, mostly be girls who think they want to be stay-at-home moms. But imagine schools saying, hey, some lines of work allow for this whether it's a stay-at-home job or something like nursing, which you can dial down to zero and then snap your fingers and have as many hours as you want and then dial back down or be the nurse at your kid's school. There are some lines of work that are more fit, are more family-friendly jobs. I don't see anybody guiding young people towards that. And so all of these things are, are fraught in that they clash with our, our culture, both the sort of symmetrical equality culture, also our workism culture, yes. and they might clash with our, our laws as well. And no, I think bringing up the question of sort of workism and tying uh, family benefits to employment is a really live debate on the left right now. I mean, Elliot Haspel, who has written a lot about childcare, is really pushing back against the idea that, um, you know, he's very concerned that we're gonna follow the same path uh, with childcare benefits that we followed with um, health insurance. And I think there are, you know, some interesting real risks there. I have, you know, I think we also see, you know, ostensibly family-friendly policies like encouraging egg freezing that are really sort of fertility <coughs> delay policies. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think if an employer is offering you egg or embryo freezing but not childcare benefits, on-site childcare, I question to a certain extent whether that's family policy or whether that is we would really, really, really like you to wait until you take maternity leave policy. In back. Noting that single adults, or at least uh, adults without children, tend to perceive the world in a very different way, do you think that maybe the rise in radical ideologies and in uh, the mental health crisis among younger adults is due to the relative decline in child rearing and the lack of perspective that comes with it? I think that's a great point, and I, I think it's probably true if only acting through the intermediary of 
uh, alienation from community, which is to say, when you become a parent, you desperately need to belong to something more than you did when you were a, a free agent. And so parents are more likely to go to church. Parents are more likely to show up at, you know, uh, story hour at the library, mommy and me yoga, or anything like that, and so more likely to be connected. And I think that connection and belonging are key inoculations against extremism. And that your ability to sort of hold on to, as I was saying earlier, radical, simplistic ideas, uh, that really gets dampened by getting married and having kids. But I also think you raise a really interesting question. You know, not everyone is called to have children. Not everyone is able to have children. And um, one thing I think we see culturally that's really unfortunate is sort of a polarization of single childless people or childless by choice people against families, against children. I mean, the sort of classic example of this is like, how dare you bring your baby on an airplane? But there is, I think there is a really interesting question to be asked, which is, how do we knit together people who don't choose to have children, people who can't have children, and people who do have families? Because you know, my husband and I have childless friends who play an incredibly mm -hmm. important role in our kids' lives. You know, the we live in between you know two divorced women in their 60s who are incredible figures in our children's lives. How do we? build a community where everyone, whether their parents or not, values children, values family, and gets some meaning about out of being in a community together, as well as support for all the family-friendly family policies that, that we'd like to spend money on. That has a historical precedent, which is you know the, the uncle uh, who never got married, the aunt who never got married, uh, that they are part of the uh, kid's life is certainly a, a great tradition throughout uh, recent history going back. And so it's not a, a radical idea to say that. And in fact, I had a, a Margaret Mead quote in there, of all people, where I said, depriving uh, people of the ability, of the opportunity to interact with kids is, uh, is really cruel, in fact. Yes, and you know, I think that children also really benefit from having adults in their lives who see them as people, who aren't mm -hmm. related to them by blood, who aren't necessarily obligated to them, but find them interesting. And who and aren't constantly telling them to clean up their yes, clothes who can, off the floor. Yes, who can be indulgent, who can be curious about them, who you know, can be a sounding board for them about their parents and help them understand their parents in the adult world better. I think that's really important. Certainly my kids are always shocked when either their, their cousins or their friends are like, your parents are cool. <laughs> Because like, my kids don't get to experience that as much. So I think we have time for one more, one more question. Um, over in the back, David. Uh, great discussion and excited to read the book. Um, Tim, I'm really grateful for your voice because I think you're one of the most outspoken social conservatives making the case for Yimbyism and housing reform at a yes. time when that issue is risking tipping more into the culture war space. So. Um, can you talk about how you see the role of housing uh, reform as part of this agenda to help families grow or start? I'm really glad you asked that because when I say that cost can't explain the 15-year baby bust, um, it, the cost of housing does traditionally really explain uh, downticks in birth rates and in marriage rates. So that's, and so what's happened in the last three years in most of the US has been a deterrent to family formation. And so some people think the way to make it affordable is just to subsidize demand. That of course will just drive up the cost. And so my uh, argument would be to increase the supply as much as possible. The tricky thing is that the YIMBYs, the yes in my backyards as opposed to the NIMBYs, I follow a lot of them on, on Twitter, and they're always posting massive apartment towers that also are ugly. Like, you don't have to subscribe to an ugly, you know, brutalism aesthetic to believe there should be more houses. But a family-friendly yimbyism would be a, a different thing from either a conservative, like, I don't want any more houses in my town because, uh, you know, the wrong kind of people move in or too many, uh, it'll clog up the parking lot, etc. But, so, uh, that's tricky because, again, I'm talking sort of about discrimination here. I'm saying local government should say, actually send us more families. And the truth is they're often doing the opposite. I quote in the book a local leader in Illinois saying, families are a cost. Businesses are an asset, 
But if you bring in families, I have to build more schools. I have to build more playgrounds. So that's the, my uh, pro-development, urbanism, yimbyism would be explicitly a family-friendly one. Um, we could stay here all night. I think we're not allowed to stay here all night. So thank you for your beautiful book. Thank you, all of you, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.